Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Encourse's presentation with Left Brain Professionals. Today's topic is Unraveling the Mystery of DCAA Compliance for Government Contractors. We're really glad that you chose to join us today. My name is Liz Brigson. I'll be your host, and let's go through our housekeeping items quickly. First of all, today's presentation is one hour, and in order to earn CPE credit for today's presentation, you'll want to respond to at least three out of the four polling questions. And if you do qualify for CPE credit, you'll be able to head out onto your Encorsa dashboard and download your CPE certificate one hour after the conclusion of today's program. If you have any questions about CPE or today's webinar, you can always email us at Encorsa, uh, support at Encorsa.com. If you've had a chance to join us before, um, you know that we do seek to make our webinars interactive. So if you'd like to head on out to the questions box that's within your GoToWebinar navigation panel, um, go ahead and just let us know where you're joining from and make sure that you can hear our audio and we'll look for that. Great, thanks everyone for responding. I see Boston, Indianapolis, Delaware, Indiana, excellent. Thanks for joining us. Um, wanted to also bring your attention to the handouts pane within GoToWebinar. Um, we do have our presenter, Robert's handouts. His presentation is loaded for you. So if you'd like to go ahead and download that PDF, you can save it for future reference. And then also you can download the handouts from your Encorsa dashboard. With that, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Today, Robert Jones will be speaking on the topic of government contract compliance. Robert is a government contracts and accounting expert. He has fantastic experience in this space. He achieved a master's of accountancy from the College of Charleston. As you can see, he has some great credentials um, behind his name as well. Um, Robert's business experience extends through business management, compliance, operations. He's also held roles as a controller before, defense contracts manager, and also a excellent instructor and speaker. So Robert, we're really excited to have you with us today. Um, your contact information is here for the audience if they'd like to follow up with you. Um, also, always encourage our audience to connect with our presenters on LinkedIn. And then, of course, you can check out Left Brain Professionals' website as well. So with that, Robert, I'd like to turn things over to you. Welcome, and I'm looking forward to what you have to share with us today. Well, thank you very much, Liz, for the opportunity. Good afternoon, uh, potentially good morning, I guess, to a few people as well still on the uh, West Coast. Uh, Liz, just tell me that you can see my screen here, please. I can, yes. All right, excellent. So yes, uh, today we're going to talk about DCAA compliance, uh, and to spell that out, that's uh, the Defense Contract Audit Agency. Uh, it's the term or phrase that uh, you'll hear around government contracts. Um, even though a lot of government contractors do work for other agencies, DCAA is um, kind of the gold standard for uh, accounting compliance, and they are, and part of that is because for many years, uh, many uh, agencies and offices of the federal government would outsource their audits and other accounting compliance tasks to DCAA. I like to get started uh, with a positive uh, share uh, every time. Uh, point us in the right direction. So my quote today is, in every day there are 1,440 minutes. That means we have 1,440 daily opportunities to make a positive impact. An easy way to, uh, to make a positive impact uh, is uh, to say please and thank you and start and end every conversation with a smile. You never know uh, exactly how far a smile goes on the other side uh, uh, of the desk or uh, the telephone. And people can hear your smiles if you are not aware of that. All right, so why are we here? Um, many government contracts and grants require uh, technically what is referred to as an adequate accounting system. You'll hear people say they need an approved accounting system. Um, approved is not really the word that you'll find in the regulations. Um, and it's more than a FAR requirement of the Federal Acquisition Regulations, the FAR. Uh, it's more than a FAR requirement for certain contract types. Uh, an adequate accounting system will help you understand your costs um, and positions you for financial success. Uh, one of the things that we often hear from clients that we work with is, 
uh, they realize that after implementing some of the stuff the government wants them to do, that they better understand all the costs that go into their product or service, um, and they find ways that they can be more profitable um, in what they do. So today we're going to learn um, the essential, essential components of an accounting system and the best practices for passing the SF-1408 survey. That's the standard form of 1408. Uh, the title of that is the Pre-Award Accounting Survey for Prospective Contractors. So uh, we, we do provide uh, information and links on that. Uh, we're going to start our first room poll here. We've got a poll question. Uh, so Liz, if you'll kick that off for us. Most definitely. So the first poll question is, are you working on or bidding on any of the following? And while we have this up on the screen, I'm sure many members of our audience um, recognize these acronyms, know exactly what they are. But do you want to talk a little bit about these types of contracts while we're waiting for the poll responses to come in? Sure. So SBIR, and I should have added the STTR to that as well. It's usually referred to as the SIBR and the STTR program. Um, those are small business um, research and technology transfer grants. Um, they are grants, uh, not uh, contracts. Um, so one of the ways that the government uh, works with industry to right, identify new technology and also to help those companies uh, develop uh, that technology to the, to the point that it can be commercialized. Uh, T&M contracts are time and material. I always tell people to think about electricians and plumbers. If you got a uh, leak in the bathroom and you call a plumber, they're going to work on a time and a material contract for you, right? They're going to charge you for the number of hours that they're there, plus whatever materials it is that they actually need to uh, replace or repair. Um, cost reimbursable contracts simply mean it's a type of contract where you're invoicing to the government uh, and what your payment is based uh, on your cost experience versus a fixed price contract where you would develop a top level price, present that to the government and you bear the risk of performing within that type of contract. And then those last two are sometimes used somewhat interchangeably, max or multiple award contracts. Um, it's a situation where the government puts out a very large contract and they end up uh, awarding it to multiple companies. Um, and then usually it's a type of contract where there are various delivery orders uh, that come out of that. Uh, a GWAC is somewhat similar. It's a government-wide acquisition contract. So it's a contract that can be used by many um, government agencies. And I'm looking at the polling there. It looks like we have a few people who are involved in the SBIR program. Uh, some involved in T&M contracts. Uh, surprisingly, I'm really encouraged to see that you have a number of people involved in the uh, cost reimbursable and just a few in the others. So that's uh, good, helpful information for me as we uh, proceed through the presentation here. Good. Thanks, everyone, for your responses. All right. So what are we going to learn today? We've got four high-level learning objectives, um, recognizing the need for an adequate or approved accounting system, uh, what you need to be looking for uh, in your business, uh, being able to list the components. So right at the end of this presentation, you should be able to list the components of accounting system uh, to describe the criteria for a government contract adequate accounting system and explain some of the best practices for successfully passing uh, the survey or audit. So why do you need an adequate, or as I said before, people refer to it as an approved accounting system? Um, Primarily, most people get into it, as we saw that about 50% of the respondents said they're involved in cost reimbursable contracts. Uh, in a cost reimbursable contract, the government is reimbursing you for your costs plus some type of fee. So that means there's a lot of risk to the government from a financial perspective. If you're continuing to submit invoices based on cost, they obviously want some level of assurance that the invoices you're providing, which would obviously be based upon your accounting system, they want to make sure your accounting system is set up correctly, that you're capturing and reporting and invoicing those costs correctly. Time and materials are treated by the government. Uh, time and material contracts are treated by the government as a cost type of contract. Um, even though uh, you would have a top level price, um, for example, on the labor rate, you're not providing them 
uh, details of, uh, of direct labor fringe and overhead in a roll-up format that you would in a cost reimbursable contract. Uh, but because time and material contracts can be open-ended in nature, um, they are treated as a cost type contract. And again, that requirement is there in order for you to have a, um, uh, an adequate accounting system. You do see here at the bottom um, on some of the slides, we do provide links uh, so that you can verify that uh, we know what we're talking about and giving you good information. Uh, at the end of the presentation, there's a link uh, to us, uh, to our website where additional information is available, where you'll find this presentation um, and uh, all of these links for the references that we talk about. So one of the other reasons that you need an adequate system is for an SBIR, and particularly it's the phase two. So the SBIR, STTR program is broken up into three phases. Uh, phase one is uh, typically awarded uh, as a uh, fixed price contract. Uh, it's a relatively small dollar amount. It's, the, it's basically to give the contractor an opportunity to um, really work on that technology and say, here's what we've come up with. We think it'll work. This is, this is kind of where we are. Phase two is that phase where the government is willing to award um, a considerable amount of money, uh, usually up to about a million dollars, that they will award uh, for you to try to figure out how to commercialize it. How do you take this technology or product to the next level? And because those awards are at the phase two are, again, and I have to say typically, we're seeing a little bit of, um, of variance in here, but typically those are cost reimbursable contracts. And because they are cost reimbursable, you have to have that approved accounting system. Uh, the SBIR uh, office of the federal government has put out some really good training materials for that community. And we've given you a link here specifically to some information um, on accounting and finance as it relates to uh, the SBIR program. Another big reason, and this is one that really slips through the cracks um, and often catches a number of contractors at all levels um, by surprise, even on fixed price contracts, you may have to have an adequate accounting system if you're getting progress payments that are based on cost. Okay, so and to be clear here, these are progress payments. These are not performance-based payments. Um, they are different. Uh, performance-based payments are uh, uh, should be objective in nature. They should be milestone types of things. Um, and usually that's something that once you meet the milestone, you are paid. This is different. These are actually progress payments where much like a cost reimbursable contract, you would actually, even though it's a fixed price contract, um, you would submit cost type invoices on the interim. Um, you're reimbursed up to 80 or potentially 85% of your cost. So the idea is that you're not um, getting reimbursed all of your cost along the way, but you're reimbursed a significant portion of your cost. And progress payments are one of those contract financing, uh, as you see there in the title of the link, uh, it's one of those contract financing options that are available. And usually this comes into play for small businesses or, and or for uh, long contracts. So let's say you've got a contract that maybe spans 12, 15, 18 months, uh, and you want a way to be able to get cash flow to the contractor, um, uh, one of the ways to potentially do that is through progress payments. And again, because they are cost oriented and start to sound like cost type contracts, you do have to have that adequate or approved accounting system. And with that, we've got uh, another poll here. So Liz, I'll let you kick that off. Great, so this second poll is, do you have an immediate need for an improved accounting system? So you can go ahead and take a response to that. And while the audience is responding, Robert, we had a couple of questions come in um, related sure. to what types of contracts require accounting systems, um, you know, approved adequate accounting systems versus which ones don't? And then also how do grants fit in that category? Yeah, so, uh, and actually it would probably be nice as I'm sitting here thinking we might need to put together a presentation for your group on a little more of uh, some government contract basics. We kind of skipped that in this presentation, um, but there's a continuum of risk on contract types. And on one side of the continuum, you have fixed price contracts where 
the risk of performance uh, financially and otherwise is primarily on the contractor, right? You're signing up to a fixed price. You're going to deliver your product or service on a certain date at this price, and it's up to you to meet that, right? And if you are over or under budget, you're the one who either, you know, bears the responsibility of that or, you know, reaps the rewards of being able to operate under budget. On the far end of the opposite end of the spectrum, you have cost type contracts. And again, those are ones where uh, you are submitting cost type invoices to the government. There's a much greater risk to the government because you as the contractor within certain limits uh, and much deeper than we can get into in the uh, scope of this presentation today, but within certain limits, you're gonna get all of your costs reimbursed to you plus some type of fee. Well, obviously there, the risk is upon the government and the more risk that's upon the government from a cost perspective, they wanna make sure that you've got an adequate or an approved accounting system. Mentioned previously, right, that those, even though fixed price contracts um, with cost, uh, I'm sorry, with progress payments that are based on cost, again, sounds like cost, sounds like a cost type contract, they begin to shift towards um, the right uh, in that uh, spectrum, which is why they require it, and specifically that SBIR um, grant. There may be requirements in other types of grants. Uh, we didn't bring that up in here, but there's always the possibility that in any specific um, grant, um, if, if it is a cost sharing or cost type of, of situation, um, that you may have to have an adequate or approved accounting system. And I do see um, some interesting uh, results here. 61% say no. So I'm glad to see that even though you don't have the need that you are here, uh, I guess I'd be curious at the end of the presentation or maybe even in a couple of days when maybe you go back and ask some questions, how many of you fall into the need exists but it's not immediate maybe or, or more so that unsure. Uh, I wonder how many of those no's become an unsure in the future. All right, so let's talk about the components of an accounting system. And one of the things I always have to remind people um, is that the accounting system is more than just your software. Uh, oftentimes when we talk about accounting systems, particularly with non-accountants, uh, with many clients, they say, oh, well, that's my QuickBooks or that's my, you know, whichever program that I use. And yes, that um, program, that software is part of your accounting system. And we've listed some common ones here, right? QuickBooks, Xero, FreshBooks. Uh, the three at the bottom and my focus today, and I realize some of you probably work on JD Edwards, PeopleSoft, Oracle. I know there's you know a bunch of other stuff out there. Uh, some of you may work on uh, other platforms. Uh, the ones that I picked are either one, uh, typical with small businesses, or two, that they are oriented towards government contractors. So those first three, I think most of us uh, would recognize as uh, common programs uh, that many small businesses use. Uh, the, the second group of three down there, the Uninet, Simpac, and Procast, uh, those are, while designed for, for small businesses as well, they are particularly uh, designed specifically for government contractors. So they have functionality in them to deal with indirect rates and cost pools and some of the other stuff that we're gonna talk about here in a few minutes. Another uh, growing area that's part of your accounting system are apps. And I probably should have, this would have been a great spot to put a, a poll in question that I didn't put, um, but I'll ask it. You don't have to answer. How many of you are using apps in your accounting system? And if I could see you raise your hands, I think everybody would raise their hands because almost all of us are using uh, some type of app for collecting time and collecting expenses, right? And many of us are doing that on our phones. Uh, again, if I, if I could ask everybody and raise hands and I could see you face to face, I'd probably see a fair number of you in the room say, yes, I use my phone or my tablet uh, to complete my timesheet or to complete my expense report. And, and Robert, because, I see a yes. number of hands raised um, from the attendees in response to your question. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I, I can't see that myself, but I appreciate that feedback. Yes, we're all using those. And because these apps, um, are capturing the accounting data, right? They now become part of the accounting system. So we have to consider them uh, when we look at an accounting system approval that we'll talk about uh, here in a few more slides, right? 
um, you know, the, when the auditors come in, they're not just going to look at, let's say, for example, QuickBooks, right? That's a common program that many companies use. They're not just going to look at QuickBooks. They're going to say, okay, but how do you capture time? How do you capture your expenses? And the moment you say that you use T-Sheets or Expensify or any number of other programs, and again, I picked some that we deal with on a regular basis, um, and, and actually, the, particularly the T-Sheets, Expensify, and Harvest work well with government contractors. Um, because of the compliance that they have built into them. Um, you know, we have to consider them as part of the audit risk uh, as well. And then the last, uh, well, I should say not the last, but the next uh, components are tools or files. So again, if I were to ask you to raise your hands, right, probably almost all of us use Excel workbooks uh, somewhere in our accounting system. Um, and, you know, whether we're building budgets in there, uh, many of us, probably, again, almost all of us, export data from our primary accounting system, get it into Excel, and manipulate it using uh, pivot tables, Power Pivot, uh, Power BI, if, many of you, if some of you are uh, converting to the Power BI platform, right? We're using these tools um, to manipulate that data for reporting purposes, so they now become part of the accounting system. Uh, we do have some uh, clients who still use paper timesheets or use Excel timesheets. They're small clients. Uh, they, they're not using one of the apps, so they're, they collect the data through, uh, you know, through an Excel workbook that everybody fills out. Somebody has to manually enter that data in the accounting system. Uh, rate calculations uh, and accruals, right? We, we perform those kinds of things in Excel workbooks, um, and it can either use that for reporting pur purposes or take that information back to the accounting system uh, to enter journal entries uh, or other items. Uh, the last two items uh, are policies and procedures. This is probably by far the big one that catches uh, most of our new small clients off guard. Again, when you say accounting system, people say, oh yeah, I use QuickBooks or I use FreshBooks or whichever one that they use. And then we say, great, okay, do you have policies and procedures? Uh, well, okay, uh, uh, kinda, you know, Sally knows what we do or, or, or Sam knows what we do, but are they written down, right? Written policies and procedures are a big part of the accounting system because they tell people, you know, what it is you do and how you do it, right? Your policy is, what do we do? And your procedures are, how do we do it? How do we carry it out? and achieve the goal of those policies. And then the last component there are the records and reports, right? So just like the IRS rate wants to come in, if you were to have an audit, what's the IRS want to do? They want to see receipts, right, to validate that those uh, are uh, indeed legitimate expenses. Um, you know, government auditors are going to want to see similar things, right? Uh, if you go through, uh, and we're only going to really talk today about a particular type of audit around the accounting system, but as government contractors, you will go through a number of types uh, of audits over time. Uh, and when you get into transactional audits, uh, those uh, government auditors will want to see invoices, receipts, uh, financial statements, uh, much like an IRS auditor would want to see as well. All right, uh, gets us to uh, our third poll here. So Liz, if you want to kick that off for us. All right, so very, very relevant poll question. Which accounting software do you currently use? And we have an audience member who asked, um, what are the weaknesses of using QuickBooks for government contracting? But then also I might ask, um, what about the strengths? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. So I'm, I'm gonna answer that one way and say that um, probably some of you or many of you have heard, if you're using QuickBooks, you cannot get an approved accounting system. And I'm here to tell you that is not a true statement, okay? Not a true statement. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, we help clients on a regular basis uh, get approved or adequate accounting systems using QuickBooks, so it is possible. Uh, the downside is that QuickBooks, FreshBooks, um, Zero, for example, they are not designed to really support cost pools and indirect rates and particularly being able to uh, allocate those indirect rates to your individual jobs. 
Um, QuickBooks, uh, again, for example, does not handle labor distribution very well, and we'll talk about labor distribution in a few more slides. Uh, because of that, it becomes a little more difficult, um, not impossible. It just means that what happens, uh, we take some of those uh, requirements to Excel and end up performing um, some of those tasks or functions in Excel and either uh, potentially importing data back into QuickBooks as appropriate, or uh, well, in the case of labor distribution, we calculate that stuff in, in Excel, do a journal entry uh, in QuickBooks to uh, move the dollars around the, to the appropriate buckets. In the case of the indirect rates, uh, we extract data from QuickBooks, put it into Excel, build reports off of it, and that becomes our reporting model for being able to show how we're calculating the indirect rates. All right, so looking at the uh, results here, and not really a big surprise to me, uh, right, a number of people using QuickBooks. Um, and again, it's somewhat not a surprise to me the number of people who are other, and I'm gonna guess that some of you uh, are probably are not in the traditional government contract space, or maybe you're some larger businesses using one of those um, other platforms that I mentioned, something like uh, Oracle, EBS, or such like that. Yes, yeah, so we are seeing a few folks using Oracle, SAP, Great Plains, Teammate, um, Dell Tech, and then yes. also um, proprietary systems as well. Yeah, and I, I forgot, I, I didn't mention Dell Tech on here, primarily because a lot of small businesses, and I apologize, I, I guess the next time I work with your group, we'll have to expand my uh, thought process a little bit. We work typically with small businesses. We do happen to have a couple of large business clients. Um, Dell Tech just tends to be a product that is not in the price range for the average small business to uh, tackle, uh, which is the primary reason that we just don't talk about it much. That makes sense. All right, so let's talk now, let's get into the nitty gritty about what are the criteria to uh, have an approved accounting system. Um, this criteria you will find on the SF-1408. Um, if you were to, again, we've Going to provide you a link later, but if you Google SF1408, just go to the GSA website, um, you'll get it. And the first criteria uh, on there is, you know, is the system in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles? Um, one of the comments I heard a number of years ago, somebody said, well, this government accounting stuff looks strange and it must not be GAAP compliant. No, everything, it's, it's all still GAAP. And as you see here, the first requirement out of the gate is you got to be following GAAP, right? So there's uh, no deviation from that at all. Um, number two actually has several sub uh, items here. So you're going to see 2A, 2B, et cetera. Uh, one of the big areas for government contractors is being able to segregate direct and indirect costs, right? So those direct costs, whether they be uh, labor, materials, travel, subcontractors, ODCs. That's the stuff that's directly attributable to an end product or end project. Um, and indirect costs would be things like your fringe, overhead, GNA, other types of expenses, right, that are not directly attributable uh, to a single product or customer project. Uh, the next requirement is being able to accumulate direct costs by contract. Government wants to know that not only are you segregating direct and indirect costs, but that you actually are doing job costing, right? Really the other, we could just call this job costing. Um, that is capturing so that every transaction, whether you're entering that uh, as uh, some type of invoice uh, in the system or whether, you know, whether it's inventory coming through that you're transferring through a shop order process, whether it's time through uh, timekeeping, expenses through some type of expense reporting, all needs to be, uh, all your direct costs, at least, need to be assigned to a contract. Uh, we take that a step further and we always set up all of our clients so that everything is charged to a job. And in fact, what we do are we create indirect jobs. So let's say they had 10 contracts, they would have 10 direct jobs. And then we always create a fringe and overhead and a GNA job. Um, and then the reason that we do that is so from a data entry standpoint, you simplify the overall process that people just get in the habit that it always has to have a job, whether it's a direct job or an indirect job, doesn't matter. We just know that everything gets assigned to a job. The next item is a logical and consistent method for the allocation of those indirect costs. 
Right, so logical and consistent. Uh, the term, the other terminology that you will hear is that there needs to be a causal beneficial relationship between the cost pool and the cost base. So let's, uh, I like to use fringe as an easy example. Uh, fringe benefits are those uh, expenses, right, the, uh, that businesses incur in order to either, uh, we're really right, to maintain employees and to retain them. Right, so our fringe expenses include things like uh, employer taxes, health insurance, 401k, tuition reimbursement, um, certain things like that. So there needs to be a logical causal beneficial relationship between the cost pool and the cost base. If the items that I just mentioned are the cost pool, then what would be the logical cost base? W-2 labor. And notice that I said W-2 labor, not just labor. Uh, many businesses employ temporary labor or subcontract labor, especially when we talk about government contractors. It's quite common for many contractors to have subcontractors helping them on stuff. Subcontract labor um, is excluded from the base of fringe because when you're hiring temporary employees or you're uh, working with a subcontractor, somebody else is responsible for those employees, right? They are not our employees. They do not benefit from our fringe. So their labor is not part of the fringe base. Um, that's what we mean by having a logical and consistent method for allocating. Or sorry, that part that I described was the cause of beneficial relationship. The allocation method in the case of fringe is you can either allocate it over direct labor dollars or direct labor hours. Um, and so uh, most people, we recommend that they follow the uh, total dollars uh, perspective. Uh, when you get into hours, um, it becomes, uh, it's easier for a company to end up in a situation where they have under allocated or over allocated our, uh, their dollars, or, I'm sorry, their, their fringe pool um, if they're using the hours method, if you have significant swings in the amount of hours that people work. Um, if you use, and that becomes problematic when you have, for example, professional employees, say engineers, who are billing hours, but they are salaried individuals. If you base it on salary, based on those dollars, um, that's going to stay steady throughout the year, and you don't have to worry about any swings in the number of hours that they're working. All right, next up on the criteria, um, accumulation of costs under general ledger control, right? So simply means, right, that you are using some type of general ledger, uh, you know, whether that's uh, and not necessarily software. One of the things that I do tell people, um, we can get you an approved accounting system on good old fashioned green bar paper. Uh, how many of you remember green bar paper from college? I do, I remember a project in college where we had those big, huge sheets of green bar paper. I was doing something for one of my accounting classes and I remember going back to my dorm room and spreading it all out all over the bed and the desk and the floor. I felt like there was green bar paper everywhere. If you wanna get an approved accounting system using paper, we can do it. Nobody says that you have to use software. However, I think we would all agree that the good old fashioned green bar paper is not an efficient method. Right? So that's why uh, obviously most of us um, use uh, software today. Uh, but all of those uh, uh, costs need to be under general ledger control. So that's things like, right, obviously having general ledger, the sub ledger, making sure that we're reconciling those sub ledgers to the general ledgers uh, on a regular basis and that everything uh, is posted. This next requirement is a big one, timekeeping system. Okay. The number one expense of most businesses is labor, right? Where especially if you're a service industry, that's definitely true. But even a lot of um, manufacturing, right? Uh, the amount of labor that goes into a lot of manufactured parts far outweighs the cost of materials. Because of that, right, the government is buying your products and services. They wanna make sure that your timekeeping is accurate that you're collecting all of the hours, that you're collecting the hours um, by job, whether that's a direct job or an indirect job, 
um, and that everything is accurate, that employees, there are some very specific details. We could put together a whole presentation just on timekeeping systems, right? There are certain requirements that the employee must fill out their own timesheet, that nobody else is filling it out for them, uh, that if there are changes to the system, that there, there, there are changes to the timesheet, that the system needs to be able to capture that change and a reason for the change. Uh, that's a big area for a lot of your timekeeping providers out there, which is why a couple that I mentioned, particularly Harvest and T-Sheets, certainly there are others. I don't get any kickbacks or fees out of any of these, just mentioned a couple that we work with. But the T-Sheets and the um, Harvest, for example, uh, are really good at the compliance aspect for DCAA so that um, you can go in there and if somebody makes a change, it forces you to put information about why you changed the timesheet. So if I put in, uh, if I go in and fill out my timesheet and let's say I make an error and the next, but I don't notice it until the next day um, and I'd go back and I try to change Monday's timesheet now, it pops up and says, hey, wait a minute, you made it, why are you making this change and captures that information. That is one of the big um, audit requirements uh, around timekeeping system. Uh, the other parts of timekeeping are to make sure that the employee knows who is providing them uh, their charge codes and their guidance um, for charging um, and that you need to be doing annual training uh, update refresher training for your employees every single year the next item uh, and so what so here's an interesting thing people say timekeeping and labor distribution they look and sound kind of similar there's a couple of unique things our experience is that um, probably almost all of our clients, even brand new ones who are new to government contract accounting and the compliance aspect, oftentimes have very good timekeeping systems. They may already be using something like T-Sheets or another program. They already have all of their projects and stuff in there. They're capturing where people are working time. And it makes sense, right? Because business owners and managers wanna know where their employees are spending time. So oftentimes they have a very good timekeeping system, but they don't have a labor distribution system. And so you might ask, well, what's the difference? Labor distribution is actually taking the dollars and distributing those dollars throughout the GL and across the various jobs, All right? So you might have a timekeeping system. And, and again, what we find is uh, companies will have a timekeeping system. They got great information over there, but when you look in the general ledger, we usually notice a couple of things. One key giveaway is that I'll look at the trial balance and immediately I see one account that says labor costs or you know salaries or whatever it is that they title it, but they have just one account in the GL. Well, in order to properly calculate your rates so that you develop your fringe overhead, GNA, and potentially others, well, we've got actually another, the next course that I'm presenting uh, in a few weeks is an in-depth dive into those indirect rates. So I encourage you to come back and listen to that. But in order to properly calculate those rates, you've got to get the overhead dollars and the GNA dollars into those other pools. Well, if you only have one GL account, then you're not allocating those dollars uh, to the other pool. And the other piece that I said was actually allocating the dollars on the job cost reports, right? So in QuickBooks, you can have something like a P&L by job um, or by customer, you know, depending on what system you use as to what, the, what they call it. Many systems will allow you to run some type of income statement or P&L by customer, by project, by job. Uh, you may actually have a job status report or a job cost report. Um, and the labor distribution is what actually moves those dollars um, to those other buckets. The next requirement is to have uh, interim, at least monthly posting of books, right? That's good accounting practice, making sure that uh, we're actually entering all of the expenses, right? We are making sure that all the AP, the AR is up to date. We're validating that the, uh, all the various sub ledgers tied to the general ledger, right? The government, again, wants to know that Right, because what's the step back and ask why again are we talking about having approved our accounting system? It's usually because there's some type of cost reporting or cost invoicing that's going on. Government wants to know that you are submitting accurate and complete uh, cost invoices, right? And how are you going to do that if you're not posting uh, books every month, right? So posting would be 
I know even in our business, right, part of what we do is at the end of the month, we reconcile the bank statement, we reconcile the credit card. Uh, once we do that, we know, okay, yep, everybody's got their expense reports in, everything is here, we've got all that. We can now go create invoices for our clients because we now have captured, right, all of the expenses. Uh, the next item is the exclusion of unallowable costs. Again, this is, uh, and Liz, I'll give you a, a poke on this one. Let's put together a presentation. This is always a fun and hot topic. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a dive on this one here. Um, unallowable costs. It's, it's always an interesting topic for uh, people new to government contracts, particularly with uh, business owners. Because the moment you say unallowable, usually the hair on the back of their head stands up, their ears perk up, they're looking at you cross-eyed like, what do you mean it's an unallowable cost? You mean I can't deduct that from my taxes? Okay, this has nothing to do with taxation. Um, in fact, many, not always, right, have to get our little uh, caveat in there, many, probably even most unallowable costs are otherwise still tax deductible. Um, has nothing to do with IRS regulations or what the IRS says you can or can't do. Um, in fact, probably the reverse is true, particularly when we talk about um, some of the meal stuff, right? Some of that stuff is actually fully allowable for government rates, but now with recent changes to the IRS tax code are not may not be tax deductible. These are two different things. Unallowable costs are simply costs that the government has deemed are not required uh, in order for you to perform work on a government contract. I did not say that they're not legitimate business expenses. Okay, I simply said that they, the government has deemed them to not be allowable. There's a whole section in the FAR, it's FAR 31. In particular, you would wanna go to FAR 31.205, it gets you into the details um, of uh, contract cost allowability. But I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Uh, one example of an unallowable cost is alcohol, right? So many of our employers say that if you're traveling, uh, you get back to the hotel, you go downstairs to get, uh, say you're at the Marriott, I'm a Marriott guy, I decide I wanna go downstairs uh, to the restaurant in the Marriott, which you won't find me, because I'm not a Marriott, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't, like the, I don't like the hotel food, but anyway, I decide to go downstairs, I'm gonna eat at the restaurant uh, in the Marriott, I decide I'm gonna have a glass of wine, maybe a glass of beer or something with my uh, dinner. My employer might say that's perfectly fine. We'll reimburse you for that. Include that in your expense report. Uh, subject to tax issues, right? Completely different conversation. But the government says the meal is allowable, right? Person's gotta eat, but they don't have to drink alcohol. And so the government says alcohol is an unallowable expense. You can't include that in your expense report. Um, another interesting example, and this is one that uh, catches people, it's one of my favorites, is that uh, interest and finance charges are unallowable. Uh, and, and essentially what the government is saying is that how you fund and operate, how you structure your business is not really our responsibility. And we're going to level the playing field from a cost and rate perspective by removing any finance charges, which could be in some ways seen as a penalty to some companies, right? I mean, so what if you have a company who is um, successful in some way, maybe they're better money managers, whatever the case is, and they're able to fund their business organically, right? From their own profits and from how they manage their cash and what they do but you have another business that for whatever reason needs to go borrow a bunch of money in order to fund their business, right? Maybe they need to borrow their working capital, um, they're cash strapped. And so when they, what happens, what happens when you go to the bank and you borrow that money, you're gonna pay interest. Uh, so obviously same thing with a credit card. You know, if you're, if you're lucky enough to pay off your credit card, business credit card every month, that's great. Some companies can't, right? And they incur uh, interest expense. The government says how you decide to fund and operate your business um, from a finance and accounting perspective is not our responsibility. So that interest uh, and finance charges are unallowable. Again, otherwise, most likely a, uh, a tax deductible item. Next item here is uh, cost by contract uh, line item. Uh, on the previous slide, I had mentioned that being able to capture cost by contract 
Um, you may have a situation where you have multiple contract line items or CLINs, um, and you likely will have a requirement to report cost by CLIN. Uh, so for example, you might have a cost type contract. Let's say I'll make up something here with like four CLINs on it. And the first CLIN might be support. Uh, the second CLIN might be material. The third CLIN is travel and the fourth clan is uh, subcontractors. And that's the way the government has uh, organized the contract. And so when you submit your invoice to the government, you actually need to show how much money did you spend in each of those separate areas. You'll submit an invoice and you'll say, clan one, labor is this, clan two, uh, material was this, clan three, travel was this, and clan four, subcontracts was a different amount, right? Well, in order to do that, your system is going to have to be able to track not only costs by job, but by uh, CLIN. Uh, and back to one of the questions from earlier about um, QuickBooks and what one of its downfalls. So they've added now uh, projects to both QuickBooks Online and QuickBooks Desktop, which is great. Uh, the ability to do CLINs within there and CLINs and, and or subtasks and projects is limited, um, similar, similar thing that we have found in other uh, software out there. That's why it's nice that uh, those other software that I mentioned to you, the SimCat, uh, SimPack, Procast, and Uninet, uh, again, are designed for government contractors. And in fact, they have very strong project accounting uh, modules in them, uh, specifically designed uh, for you to be able to set up your uh, contracts or projects with the appropriate uh, CLINs underneath them there. Additional criteria include the segregation of pre-production costs. So let's say uh, you're making your product, you're a manufacturer and you have to manufacture the product for your government contract, um, but you incur some kind of pre-production cost. Let's say you go out and, uh, I don't know, maybe you do some, I can't think of a good example at the moment, but you do something to ready the floor, ready the machinery, um, stuff like that for um, you know being able to to run uh, to, to run this particular project through your manufacturing floor. You need to be able to segregate those costs out. Uh, on a, in a similar vein, I would also say that your project accounting and, and your timesheet stuff and your expenses, you need to be able to align all of that uh, dollars and hours uh, to the period of performance. Very, very important that your system is able to track period of performance on a project or a contract so that you can identify if any expenses were incurred outside of that period of performance. If you have expenses incurred outside the period of performance, you cannot invoice them, okay? I don't care if it's even by a day, you cannot invoice them. Uh, that is something that will uh, that will be tested in an audit. So if you go again, you go through some type of uh, transactional audit against the contract in the future, um, go through an incurred cost audit. One of the things that they can test is to see what is the period of performance of this contract, and show me a general ledger of all costs, right? Charge against this contract, and if they see costs that were incurred. Now you might legitimately incur them, right? Which is fine. Um, but if you incurred them outside of the period of performance and you tried to bill them, that's going to get you into trouble. Uh, so there are a couple of uh, criteria uh, that you will find in contracts. If there is a limitation of cost or a limitation on payments clauses in your contracts, and they're very specific clauses, Basically, a uh, limitation of cost, right, is that you're not exceeding 75% of the costs that were agreed to. You have to notify um, the contracting officer uh, within 60 days of when you're going to exceed that amount. Um, so you need a system that can help you track that. Uh, it's an interesting little calculation because you're supposed to notify the contracting officer uh, within 60 days of when you will exceed exceed it, not 60 days. Uh, so you can't wait until you hit the 75% threshold and then notify the contracting officer. You're supposed to notify the officer when you're contracting officer when you're going to uh, exceed the 75% within 60 days, right? I hope you guys catch the nuance there 
um, it is an important nuance, right? We don't wait until, so if you run a report and you say, here's the total dollar value of my contract system, tell me when I've hit 75%. Well, that's a helpful piece of information, but unfortunately, if you wait until you actually hit the 75% threshold, and then you notify the contracting officer, it can take them time in order to issue a modification, right? If we're talking about a cost type contract, they've given you uh, a threshold in the beginning and not to exceed, uh, or they've partially funded it, um, whatever the case may be. Uh, if you wait until you hit the 75% threshold, it may take them time to get additional funding and or to get the modification through the system. And they may not be able to do that in 60 days. Uh, that's why that 60-day um, uh, threshold uh, is very important in being able to do that. So you need good data in your system to help you track that. Uh, again, we mentioned progress payments earlier, right? So do you have progress payments that are part of any contract? Uh, if so, you're going to have that, have that approved accounting system. Is the data captured and reported by the uh, system sufficient for follow-on acquisitions, right? One of the things the government's going to do is, um, you know, when they come back to you for more work and you put together a proposal with your basis of estimate, one of the best things that you can put in your basis of estimate is to say this was, these are hours, these dollars are based on actuals from a similar project or maybe a follow one of an existing project, right? So if the government um, issues you a co cost type contract and they come back to you to either extend that work or potentially for another type of, for another contract for the same or similar work, they want to know that you can provide them good information out of the system right, that they can rely on uh, in negotiating that, uh, that follow-on contract. And then the last question is pretty simple. Is the system in full operation? Uh, one of the nice things about this survey, um, people refer to it an audit. It is technically a survey. Uh, the auditors will call it an audit. It's not technically an audit. Um, but they're looking at where are you now um, so this is not, this particular survey is not transactional. They will look at some transaction stuff just to kind of validate how the system is configured, but it is not a transactional audit. They're looking at how are you doing things now going forward, not necessarily how you did them in the past. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, uh, and we have this situation at times where we have a client, uh, we're getting a client ready, the system is ready to go, but they may not be using it because they may not have a requirement to use it yet. All right, give, uh, having a slight pro, oh, there we go. Uh, getting to our last polling question, I was having some uh, technical difficulties there. So Liz, if you'll kick that off. All right, so this is our fourth polling question. And the question is, do you feel ready to pass the accounting system survey, also known as the audit? So go ahead and respond to that. And a question that came in uh, from an audience member uh, related to T-sheets, and I think you may have touched on this, Robert, um, would T-sheets help with labor distribution? So unfortunately, T-sheets in and of itself does not really help with labor distribution. What, they, what you can do and what we currently do is you can go in and export, right? The data is there, so it's great. They have a lot of good reporting. You can export those reports to Excel um, or export that data to Excel. Very easy to do from that perspective, and you're capturing your, your hours by contract. On, and they have a quasi-labor dist distribution approach, but it's not, uh, it doesn't work well that we've found yet. Um, it's an area that needs a little bit of help. So we end up extracting the data performing those calculations in Excel, um, and then doing a journal entry in uh, QuickBooks or whatever the system is in order to, um, to get the dollars where we want them. That makes sense. And for the audience, um, we do have a good response rate for this final fourth polling question. Um, so we'll close that down. And it does look like we have about a third of the audience who says, yes, we're ready. Another third that says mostly ready, and the remainder is um, somewhere in those last three buckets. Yeah, yeah. well, hopefully, uh, you know, if, if those of you who are in those other buckets of, of unsure or no, or you're trying to figure it out, um, you know, feel free to uh, contact us. My uh, contact information was up there before. It'll be uh, uh, on a slide here in a moment. 
so we've got a few minutes left and a few things to get through here. You know, so what are some of the best practices uh, to get through the survey or the audit? Start early, uh, and by start early, I mean even if you are new and young to government contracts, even if you're only doing fixed price work and you're not doing cost reimbursable type work yet, uh, or maybe you're only in phase one of the SBIR and you're, you think, wow, phase two seems so far away, start early, start early, start early. It's much easier to get the foundation in place and build upon it um, than it is to try to wait later. And then, you know, what I describe is we end up coming in and helping you unlearn a bunch of bad habits that you've learned along the way. Complete the checklist yourself. Go download the SF-1408, you know, gather all of your supporting documentation. That is gonna be the first step. In fact, uh, Melissa, my one of my colleagues, is out at a client right now. Uh, luckily, we've been working with them. Um, we're not as far along as we had hoped to be, but we were working with them in that early stage. Uh, they just received the request from the government to do it, and lo and behold, what did the government do? They sent the checklist and basically said, fill this out, give us your answer, send it back. They're going to evaluate that checklist and then come back and actually be on site to perform uh, the survey, and we will be there uh, with the client to help them through the process. You know, and the other is, and I don't say this necessarily just to, to tout my services, but seriously hire an outsider. Um, one of the things that I tell people is make sure you get an attorney and an accountant who understand government contracts. And that is not a knock at all to the rest of you CPAs and other accountants out there. You guys do fabulous work. You do taxation, you do personal financial statements, a bunch of stuff that Yes, as a licensed CPA, I can do, but it's an area of business that I do not practice. Um, we practice only government contracts. That's our bread and butter. We know that stuff inside and out. Um, and a lot of CPAs and other accountants don't know that stuff. And so I always encourage people, you certainly got to keep, you got a good tax CPA, keep them. We are not here at all to take away their business. We're here to help you uh, strictly from the government contract side. So those of you who are out there, if you're working in industry and you guys don't have uh, somebody who really understands government contracts, I strongly encourage you um, to find somebody to, uh, to bring onto your team. Uh, a couple of more things for me, as I said, um, so there's the link here. My website is leftbrainpro.com. Uh, if you go to ncorsa-dcaa-19, uh, it's a clickable link if you download the uh, stuff from uh, the Corsa platform here. If you go to that website, a couple things, it's another way to get uh, access to the uh, presentation. Also, we have direct links to all the stuff that we talked about, all the various regulations and other things. Uh, so it's a great way um, if you want to find more information. Uh, my colleague, Melissa, often presents with me. You see her picture here. Unfortunately, she is uh, on site with a client today. We had a last minute audit issue, and so she couldn't join me. Uh, but our contact information is there, uh, very simply, uh, Melissa at and Robert at leftbrainpro.com. Uh, uh, one last little shameless plug from me, we are hiring. So those of you who are out there, maybe you uh, uh, are considering a change. If you're interested, if you've got experience, we're looking for another government contract accounting consultant to do what we do. Fair amount of travel is involved. We offer... Uh, what I feel is a fairly competitive salary, but I think a couple things that set us apart, we do have an unlimited PTO policy. Uh, we have a SEP where we contribute 20%, yes, to 0% um, to your retirement. Uh, we have funded that uh, 100%. Uh, we've met the 20% uh, mark for four years running um, and done well at that. If you're interested, there's a link there on Workable. You can download the uh, uh, full job description uh, and apply directly online. So now we had a couple of questions coming along the way. I know we're down to the last couple of minutes. So Liz, if you've got any other questions, I'm happy to take them. Very good. Thanks, Robert, for an excellent presentation. Before we get to Q&A, and we did get a chance to discuss many of the questions during our pauses for the polls, um, I did want to draw the audience's attention over to the chat box because both of those links for the additional resources and to schedule a follow-up discussion with you, Robert, and also the link to um, the job posting, those are both in the chat box. So if the audience wants to awesome. head up, click through the chat box and just launch a web browser and take a look, um, that's right there and accessible. 
Um, we do have one question that I'd like to cover briefly before we close with our housekeeping items. And the question relates, going back to what we talked about, allocating those fringe benefits. Can you remind us, would those fringe benefits be allocated over direct labor or total labor? So fringe, and I think I may have misspoke uh, out of uh, my, my tongue got tied. Fringe is allocated over total labor dollars. And again, that is W-2 labor. That's those employees. Um, when we talk about carrying labor and fringe to the other pools, uh, we would allocate, you know, if that labor distribution, right, we're going to take that overhead labor and get it into the overhead pool, the G&A labor to the G&A pool. At that point, we would allocate the associated fringe for those pools to the others. But the fringe calculation itself, in order to develop your fringe rate, is based on total W-2 labor. Excellent. And I responded um, to um, the question in the questions box as well for everyone to see. Very good. Well, thank you very much. It sounds like your team is quite busy. Is that uh, at this time of year or is it kind of the nature of these audits? Does it continue to persist throughout the whole year? Uh, it's been a little bit of both. So those incurred cost audits, which we didn't talk about, um, and topic for, whole topic for another uh, presentation. Uh, many of those are due June 30th. So June was a busy time for us. Um, business is growing right now, which is why we're hiring somebody. We just signed a new client yesterday um, and, and doing well and um, just plugging along. Excellent. Very good. Well, Robert, we're looking forward to having you back next month on August 13th, also at 1 p.m. Um, as you mentioned earlier, the topic will be building government contract indirect rates. So that'll be great to have you back and hopefully the audience can join us again. Just to close with a few brief housekeeping reminders. Um, again, if you are able to respond to at least three out of those four poll questions, your CPE certificate will be available for you to download from your Encorsa dashboard an hour after the conclusion of today's webinar. And you'll also have the ability to download or access the recording and also download the course materials for today as well for future reference. Again, I'd like to encourage you to schedule time to continue the discussion with Robert. There were many of you who had some specific questions that I think would be best answered on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And then also um, those two links, I know Robert um, has a whole landing page specifically for the Encorsa audience um, with quite a bit of information and links out to external resources as well. So I'd encourage you to check that out. Um, and if consulting and travel is something that you're interested in, again, then um, there's also a job opportunity with left brain professionals, and it seems like a very dynamic field um, with a lot of really neat responsibilities. So thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Robert, and we look forward to having you back with us next month. Take care. Thank you for the opportunity.